Hi, folks. Thanks to be here for this talk about an introduction to stream processing. I'm Nicola Frankel. I've been a developer for two decades, and I'm a recent developer. So when I started my career a long time ago, um, all data was stored in SQL databases. And it has some implications. The first one is, first, we don't want duplication. You, you've learned uh, when you were taught SQL that you, we don't will learn duplication because when a, 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 an entity has a relationship with another entity, then if multiple entities have relationship with the same entity, we can just change the data with the a related entity and all will magically appear to have been updated. If you duplicate the data, and for example, you have, uh, I don't know, the uh, address of a company that uh, is referenced like in some other entities, and you need to change uh, the records of the address of the company, you will need to change it in every record. And that we don't want to do that. There is also another reason that is uh, less talked about is at the time when uh, SQL systems were designed, storage was quite expensive, and so duplication of data was just taking space from nothing. Another implication of SQL is we actually want data quality. So we put constraint to say, hey, this is a date, this is a timestamp, this is a voucher of 20 or whatever. So you put as much constraints as possible on your model um, so that you are sure that it conforms to your like, design. But actually, when we think about it, um, this is all designed for writing. We think about writing. And in some cases, that's not really what interests us. Is when, when you're reading stuff, that's not interesting. When you read stuff, um, you probably want to be fast. And if you have SQL with joints, especially when you've got many joints over several tables, that slows you down. And so it boils down to, uh, I want data to be correct versus I want data to be like quickly available. And let me tell you about two use cases that I believe are quite uh, like interesting. The first one is analytics. I worked at some point in retail and one of the common requirements in retail is to have some analytics over the previous hour in general. So imagine you are a supermarket director and you've got a, 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 like a big stock of bananas and it's Saturday and on Sunday you won't be open. And you know that if you don't sell your bananas on Saturday, on Monday, you will need to throw them out because they will be like too black for, 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 for selling. What you want probably to do is to have the analytics of your sales of banana so that if you don't sell enough, you can provide some discounts. So hourly, you will need to uh, ask your IT department for the statistics and then check like hour by hour. And you want that data as fast as possible, of course. Um, and then there is reporting. In general, you have a bank and I don't know about your country, but uh, in France, you receive every um, every month, you receive your, your bank accounts with your, like the operations, the credits, the debits, and the balance. And for that, again, it will be done at the end of the month. It needs to be as fast as possible because you have like lots of customers and you don't want your, uh, your accounts to take too long to uh, compute and then to print. And so for that reason, we invented the concept of ETL, of extract transform load, because you have different actors and different needs. And in that case, it doesn't stand to reason to use the same database. So you've got your like transactional database, you will extract the data, you will transform it so that it, there is no more join. You don't care about duplication anymore. The idea is when you load it into this new database, then here you can like execute queries that are meant to be very, very fast. 
And the, the thing is, there is also another reason is if you um, have the same database for like transactions and analytics, then you will put additional load on the database. And in general, uh, databases, they scale up to a point, especially like SQL databases. Uh, we'll see later, they were not designed to scale horizontally, they scale vertically, and then you are limited by hardware or software. So the idea is, what does this extract transform load? How is it implemented? Well, batches. Batches are everywhere. I believe even if you are in a junior in the industry, you've probably even now have been confronted by batches. And so they have interesting characteristics. The first time, the thing is they are scheduled at regular intervals. Like I mentioned, the supermarket analytics every hour or the monthly uh, statement by the bank or monthly. And they run in a specific amount of time. And you see probably where I'm heading at. Um, you've got some issues sometimes. The first issue is that when you design your batch, you have this uh, like schedule in mind. And so you take great care that you don't overlap. So if you need to run every hour, you take care that it runs, like, let's say, 30, 40 minutes topmost and gives you a buffer. But in general, data increases over time. And the ops people, they are checking carefully that uh, the time it takes to execute the job actually increases over like months, years, or whatever. And at some point, there is a chance that the time it takes to run your job is actually like longer than the period, than the scheduled period. And even if it's not the case, if your batch takes, let's say, 40 minutes for a, a, a batch that is scheduled hourly, what if it stops for whatever reason, if it fails at 35 minutes, like 35 plus 40, means you will again go uh, over the period. And sometimes also what happens, again, with the increase of data, is that the space it takes in memory exceeds the capacity. For the later point, well, that's quite easy. Yeah, we keep a cursor, so we don't handle everything. We just handle like a slice of the data, and we manage chunks of data. And of course, it's only uh, possible when data is we, we don't need to do validation of data of different chunks. Then there is a new problem is what about new data? For all those reasons, we wanted something to scale horizontally. And again, the SQL systems, they, are not, they were not designed to scale horizontally. The idea was, hey, we don't have much data. Well, we didn't at the time, but we want data to be like correct, to be true. And so the whole idea behind SQL and databases is this. We want data to be correct. And you can scale up to a point. Big data said, okay, we okay, we, we mostly want data to be correct, but um, the best, the, the, the most wanted characteristic we want is, is we want to scale. And we want to scale again because of uh, software and hardware limitation. We are limited. Uh, with vertical scaling, we want to scale horizontally as much as possible. So the idea behind that big data and NoSQL databases was we scale like web scale. But of course, uh, there is nothing uh, like free. And uh, the idea was we, we can scale as much as possible to have like right speed, but at some point, you will need to read the data. So if you dump everything into your database and you don't do any checks, because of course you have constraints and constraints uh, take time to, uh, to check, then that means that the job of like managing, checking that the data is in the correct format uh, is when you do the query. And so there is this tension between, hey, is it better to, be, to do schema on read or schema on write? If you want to be very, very fast when you write, 
then you probably do schema on reads. But then you like move the problem and uh, the time it takes to validate the data when you read the data. So you have very fast writes, but then you have slow reads. On the opposite side, uh, if you uh, design, and depending on your NoSQL database, it can be possible or not, if you implement constraints when you actually write, you slow down your writes, but you make reading so much fast. So be careful about that. Um, yes, you can be very, very fast in writes, but that means that your uh, queries will be slow. But recently, we, we saw another thing coming. And the idea is, OK, databases are meant to store stuff, but how do we handle data out of it? And the idea comes uh, from an old uh, paradigm in programming, which is even driven programming. If you interact with a user interface, you probably have been confronted with events like, hey, instead of doing something at the time or whatever, the idea is you do something when something happens. Like when the user clicks a button, you do something. And so we can leverage that and say, hey, let's make everything even based. And of course, there are a couple of benefits with that. The first, I told you about the storage space that might uh, be too small to take all the data in memory. Well, if you've got one small event, then it becomes a no-brainer because the event is, of course, very small. Because of that, it's easily processed. And another side effect, which is actually very beneficial, it is instead of like every time, like pooling data and pooling data, you actually are reacting to data. You are Data is pushed toward you. And data is pushed as soon as something happens. And so this is as closer as you get to real time. There is no such thing as real time, because even light takes time to move from one point to another. And of course, we are talk taking about, talking about uh, IT systems. So there will be like eventual consistency of data coming in. But this is still very close to even time. And it keeps like the derived data. So you've got the source of truth and you've got the derived data. And if you have even streaming, it will be like as, as close to um, the source of truth as possible. So you will have like very much in sync instantly or again, near instant in sync properties. Of course, there, there are like not so good side effects. And one of the worst is how you think about it. Before you were thinking in batches, you were thinking in chunks. And now you think about streaming and it's never ending. So you know when you start to stream, you never know when it ends. Actually, it ends when you stop it explicitly. Otherwise, it's just an infinite stream of events. You've got also new characteristics. Um, before you were able to do aggregation on your bench. Now you can still do aggregation, of course, but since it's a flow of events, you need to explicitly design your um, stream so that if you want some aggregation, you need to define over which window of time you want it. And you, there, there are different like kinds of windows. You can have like tumbling windows every five minutes, or you can have like sliding windows. Again, it depends on your needs, um, but you, you need to think about it. The idea behind streaming is quite easy to understand. The first is you've got sources, and the second is you've got sinks. And in the meanwhile, you will do some transform, some enrichments, some ML inference. Now it's pretty a hype to do some machine learning inference. And when you do enrichment, you probably want to have data available around. So not only in databases, because if you have data in databases, it will take time to fetch it, but it should be as close to possible to the stream processing engine um, if you want uh, speed. And it opens a lot of new doors. Um, real time, I was talking about real time. 
let's get uh, back to my uh, example of uh, the supermarket director. Supermarket director wants the data as soon as possible. He actually don't want the data hour by hour. But this is how we design the system, because when you only have batches, you need to say, hey, I want the batch to run every hour. If you want to think about correctness, there is a first issue. The first thing is, if we run the batch every hour, the batch is not instant. It will take some time to get the results. So let's say you will need to run it every hour, and then you will get the result at H plus one, two minutes, whatever. I, I don't care. So regarding correctness, this is not correct because we want to have the, uh, the, the data as fast as possible. But it's even not that that is the biggest issue. We need to wait the full hour to get the results. Now imagine if we, get the re if we could get the result like five minutes before the hour. Not much can happen in those five minutes unless you've got, I don't know, like somebody who uh, like is crazy about bananas and buy 10 kilos of bananas, but probably it, it, that won't happen. Let's say that the, the probability is very small. So most of the time you want data as fast as possible and you don't need to complete the full uh, cycle to act upon it. Now, if you've got a stream of events, you will get data as soon as it comes and you can already have some interesting insights about your data. You can see the trend of sending your bananas as it progresses and you can make decisions as soon as you want. And well, again, as I mentioned, imagine you have uh, some learning model, some machine learning model. If you like push this data to your machine learning stuff, then you can make some predictions again in close to real time. So I believe those are huge benefits. There are a couple of uh, in-memory stream processing engines on the market. Um, there are like on-premises one, like Flink or Hazelcast. There are cloud-based ones such as Kinesis or Dataflow. And there is also an interesting project called Apache uh, Beam, which uh, is meant as an abstraction layer over like some of the uh, previously uh, named uh, stream processing engine. Of course, it's not perfect because it's an abstraction, so it's leaky and there is no standard regarding stream processing engine, but I think it's, it's um, an interesting initiative to mention. A couple of words about Hazelka, since I will be using it in the demo, but um, most of what I will tell later can be applied to any stream processing engine. The first is it's open source. Uh, we have a unified batch and streaming API, and of course, we have also um, an enterprise offering, but uh, what I will show you afterwards is entirely open source and free. There are two concepts, and I will use the semantics of Hazelcast, but actually um, the concepts are like very widespread. There is the concept of the pipeline. The pipeline is code or configuration that tells where you will read from, what steps of transformation you will uh, like execute the data uh, on, and where you will write to. And once you've defined that, you probably have a client that will uh, take this code and send it to the stream processing engine. The stream processing engine receives it. It knows about the topology. It knows about the code. And it can distribute the loads over the nodes and uh, depending on the topology. And then when that happens, that becomes a job. Hazelcast has two uh, deployment options. The first one is embedded mode. If you are a Java developer, that's pretty uh, good because that means that you can use uh, Hazelcast just as a library. You just use it um, as a dependency, Maven or Gradle or whatever. So you put it on your class bus, you start a node, and then there is an auto discovery mechanism that uh, they will, uh, the nodes will uh, like uh, check their other nodes on the same network and they will form a cluster. This is good to start with. Uh, however, of course, then the loads of the application plus the loads of hazel costs um, might not be compatible in a single GVM. So in general, when you start relying on hazel cost as an infrastructure component, 
you probably want to go to the client server mode. Client server mode, um, you have a dedicated nodes uh, and you can, of course, run the, uh, a shell script, but probably you will want to use uh, our containers or even run it on Kubernetes. We have hand charts or operator. And then your application acts as a client of the cluster. And the good thing with that is that then you are not bound by Java anymore. Um, you can, we have several uh, client APIs such as Node.js, C Sharp, .NET, uh, C++, uh, Python, and Go. And the platform itself is pretty similar to what I've shown you before. Um, you've got uh, readily available uh, sources, readily available targets. Um, because hazel cost also is, is an in memory data grid, you can like load data beforehand so that the enrichment process is much, much faster. And um, yeah, something that I forgot to mention is uh, you, you, we've got an API, so if there is no connector, and in the demo, I will show you how to read data from a web service, for example, you can actually create your own connector. Um, I will be using for the demo uh, something called the GTFS because I want to have a demo from um, public transportation. And this is interesting because this is not a public specification or let's say it's not provided by a, a public uh, organization, it's provided by Google. But it's still interesting because uh, it seems uh, some of the organizations are using it nonetheless. It's based on two kinds of data. So the first one is static data, and static data is data that doesn't change often. Um, here, uh, a bus station, for example, a bus station might change sometimes, but not regularly. So um, for static data, you will uh, download files regularly. And you have dynamic data, and of course, the dynamic data is the position of the public transport, and this changes regularly. So here, is a very, very high overview of the dynamic model. This is the root message, this is what you get, and this has multiple feed entities, and each feed entity can have a vector position. This is what is interesting to us, because this is um, what I want to show on the map. The data provider, as I mentioned, is from California. Before, I used the Swiss one. They changed their format, so I cannot use it anymore. Um, that's why uh, the GitHub repo is called train, jet train, and now it will be about buses. The pipeline is the following. First, I will uh, read from a web service. Now, afterwards, I need to split, as I mentioned, the, uh, I've got a huge um, envelope. I need to split it into updates. Then I transform it into JSON format. I need to filter out malformed data. That's very, very important. Um, because every time uh, my uh, application fails, it will stop uh, the stream. So I don't want to do that. Then I will do some enrichment. And as I mentioned, I have static files for that because the event is normally self-contained and it references with ID or whatever, all the stuff. So here it references the top time, the trip, the routes and whatever. Then because of front end requirements, I will transform the hours into time time. Then um, I will need to, to flatten the JSON. Again, this is for front-end requirements. I, I don't want to have like nested JSON. I want to have as much as possible everything flat. Um, I want to peak because I want to make sure that everything works as expected. And if it doesn't, I want to have some logging. If I log everything, uh, there will be a lot of logs. Uh, so I will do some sampling on the logs. And then I put everything into um, in a map, in an in-memory map. So I need first to transform it into a map entry to say, hey, this is the key and this is the value. Uh, the key is the ID of the event. The value is, of course, the JSON payload. Um, the architecture overview is the following. So I will have like a stream processing engine. Here I'm using JET, of course, uh, ready. And then at some point, I will uh, have a loader uh, pipeline that will run and um, it will read the data files that I've previously downloaded. It will transform them, put them in JSON format and put them, each of them, in a dedicated map. Then when I'm ready, this is when this is finished, I will have another loader that will actually launch a new job. The new job will read the open data endpoints and will go through 
the pipeline that I've shown you before with all the steps and then store the data in JSON format. Then a third component will actually like register to changes. And every time there is a change, I have some front end magic and I'm not a front end developer. So I relied on a colleague to actually um, like display that on a map. So now the web app is reading from the in-memory data grids. And if we go like closer uh, to the map, you can see that um, it reads from the memory data grid. So there will be on the front end a schedule because if I do it as fast as possible, I will overflow my uh, front end uh, browser. And so what happens is that uh, it gets the value at time x, it knows the value at time y, and meanwhile, when it doesn't receive data, it will like compute uh, the, the, the place, the bus, or whatever it should be. And then when it receives the new data point, it sets it at the correct place. So here we can see that <laughs> the schedule is perhaps a bit fast, uh, but here seems to be much better, I know. There is also uh, an issue with this demo so far, is uh, I'm not leveraging one of the files I'm receiving, and the file is the route. So actually, uh, sorry, is uh, the path. Um, so when I've got uh, like uh, two stops, the stops might not be in a straight line, and probably they are not. So in general, you would have a path that tells you where uh, the bus goes through. And here, I'm just interpolating that uh, is just like a bird in a straight line coming from one stop to the other. Um, I need to do that since a couple of times, but my front-end skills are pretty low. So, so far, I didn't manage to use it. It still gives you a nice approximation of uh, what is happening. OK, um, so this is the end of the demo. Um, recap. So compared to batch, streaming has a lot of benefits, as I've tried to show you. And uh, if you've got data to leverage, so much the better. If you don't have data, just go and check. There is open data endpoints everywhere. And you can leverage it to uh, do pretty cool stuff. So thanks a lot for your attention. You can read my blog. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, we've got documentation on what I've shown you. You can check it here. Uh, you've, we've got uh, a GitHub repository. So if you are interested in the codes, 